We're here at the O'Galley Recreation Area in western Wisconsin. In the entry to the park, you can see they've carved the road through, and you get a clear sight of these walls that are, you know, limestone walls. One of the things to understand that's so important about the expanding earth is that all of this is limestone. I'm 800, 900 feet above sea level. That means this was the bottom of an ocean. Where'd all the water go? Much less the fact there's another 100 feet of rock above me. This was the bottom of an ocean a million years ago. And so the question then becomes, how do we get all the water down into the Atlantic and down into the Pacific if this was the bottom of an ocean? And the answer is, the crust of the earth expanded. And in that expansion, the water then drained to the new low point. There is a dirty little secret amongst archaeologists and paleontologists. Dinosaurs, as we understand their bone and muscle structure today, could not walk on the surface of the earth as it exists gravitationally. Their body weight would be crushed. This footage is beautiful art, but also complete fantasy. That the dinosaurs lived on a planet with lower gravity was the subject of a Thunderbolts Project interview of author Ted Holden. Holden believes the ratios in nature would hold true over scale and time, and this gives evidence that gravity on Earth has changed radically since great antiquity. Right, we know what the limits of, of, of size for a human athlete would be, right? So, I mean, any kind of a size limit you could compute for the human athlete is also going to serve as an upper bound for any sort of a herbivore of the same size. On the left side of the equation, I'm going to say, okay, Bill Kazmaier plus the bar is like 350 pounds plus the thousand for the bar, right? 1350 divided by the two-thirds power of 350 equals on the right side of the equation, just the guy lifting himself up off the floor, right, just x divided by the two-thirds power of x and solve, right, you get a number like somewhere between 18,000 and about 21,000 pounds, right? That's the theoretical maximum size limit for, for the world. For one of the strongest athletes that we know anything about, that's the theoretical limit. And the thing that's funny is the biggest elephants that we know anything about are typically 14, 15, 16,000 pounds. Now, I don't think anybody claims to have any kind of a stuffed elephant any bigger than the one that you see at the Smithsonian. There have been two rapid expansions. The first ended the era of the dinosaurs, and the second was the Venus Cataclysm 12,900 years ago, which ended the megaflora and megafauna. To explain why the Earth expanded in the cataclysm, we need to address the other elephant in the room. What is the sun, and why does it never seem to get smaller, despite putting out physical matter measurable in the solar winds. Let's just put this out there. Scientists can measure that the Earth moved one and a half centimeters away from the Sun last year. However, they cannot confirm the Sun is getting any bigger or any smaller. Either the Sun is a printer ink cartridge with only so much hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and carbon, for example, or the Sun rests static in size and converts energy into matter. Wal Thornhill of the Thunderbolts Project believes all stars behave as an anode in the galactic discharge. What needs addressing is where all the protons and atoms found in the solar wind are coming from. Let's look at the core of the Sun from the standpoint of an anode and use a galvanic battery to understand better. The anode is the negative end of your common battery. While most think that their car battery runs off of the cathode side, the fact is it runs by grabbing an electron from the anode side and pulling it to the cathode side turning your car on in the electrical perturbation. It is the theory of plasma researcher Brant Callahan that the energy of the anode sun is drawn in from the ether. The yet to be understood black holes at the center of the galaxy then serve the purpose of a galactic cathode, sucking the energy back into the ether through the black hole at the center of our galaxy. This model creates a fully functioning circuit. The first law of thermodynamics is not only preserved, but explains physical matter coming from the Sun, which never shrinks, and the black hole at the center of the galaxy, from which nothing escapes. If the Sun has a magnetic shield, the Sun has a zero point. No scientist on Earth will argue that point. If the Earth has a magnetic shield, and this is also a point no one debates, then the Earth also has a zero point field as well. All necessary ingredients exist to create matter at the core of the Earth except the massive influx of energy. This fact is what separates the Venus Cataclysm from the Utnapishtim or Noah Cataclysm flood 6,000 years ago. The Venus Cataclysm resulted in a direct exchange from one core to the other 
expanding the Earth's crust and carving massive electric formations across the entire Earth, where the solar micronova 6,000 years ago bathed the Earth in plasma, which followed the Electric Universe model for the creation of star water and a flood. Plasma researcher Andy Hall believes the cataclysm can best be described as moments of high pressure and low pressure exchanges of energy. Electrically, the cataclysm should be looked at from an energy in, energy out exchange across the surface. The most visual way to present this would be to consider them both as two plasma globes interacting in space. By my estimation, Earth was approximately 40% smaller than Venus. The first primary arc drove a direct exchange between the core of Venus and the Earth. In an act of radical electrical potential equalization, a portion of the electrons and protons of Venus's core experienced a plasma transfer to the Earth's core. This exchange through the Earth's zero point merged the protons and electrons in the z-pinch in the same process as the Sun and caused the expansion of the Earth's crust. This exchange, in particular the exchange of protons, explains why Venus and Earth are both the same size, but Venus is only 80% of the Earth's mass. It gave the mass to the Earth in the form of a proton exchange, which was converted into atoms in the Earth's new crust. How much did the planet expand? The northern edge of the Pacific Ocean shows the clear expansion arc from Alaska to the Kamachka Peninsula. It's not the continents that fit together, it's the continental shelf. Here is the S-shaped plasmoid form which runs through the Hawaiian Islands. The fundamental difference between the formation of the Pacific and the formation of the Atlantic is that the Pacific represents high pressure energy entering into the Earth's core through the West Coast strike, while the Atlantic represents a low pressure extraction of electrons and the Earth's crust. This is why the Mid-Atlantic Ridge exists in the middle of the Atlantic and why the Pacific has no major formation, save the Hawaiian Islands. They are opposing manifestations of the ocean's creation. That the Pacific plate formed in the cataclysm explains why it is the only plate considered to be surrounded by a ring of fire. This plate was not part of the original crust. Finally, the expansion of this new plate pushed Antarctica into the polar position and explains why subtropical organic material was found in the mud core samples off the coast. In 1992, clay core samples taken off the coast of Antarctica showed that at one time in the past that continent was exposed to subtropical temperatures. It was warm in Antarctica's past. South America kind of warm. That is a fact, again, which no scientist can dispute. How does a continent end up so out of place? The new plate pushed Asia west and Antarctica south. The Sandwich Islands with a perfectly rounded arc represent the necessary connection during the plate expansion to the original South Pole. From here one could literally zip Antarctica back up along the coast of South America. This may shock most but Antarctica is actually the lost continent of Atlantis. When Solon said Atlantis had sunk beneath the sea in a day it literally sunk to the bottom of the earth in a day. There it was covered in ice and became inaccessible to any and all survivors. Now, does this make more sense? How about this one? And more importantly to our larger story on this channel, how about this one? As I always like to say, if what I've laid out isn't true, it sure makes great fiction. Like, share, subscribe, leave me a comment down below and let me know your thoughts. Peace.